Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In 1604, King Henry IV granted a fur monopoly to a French noble who led a colonizing expedition to an island located near the mouth of the St. Croix River, which in time was to mark the international boundary between the Canadian province of New Brunswick and the American state of Maine. In the spring of 1605, France's St. Croix settlement was moved to a new site across the Bay of Fundy on the shore of the Annapolis Basin, an inlet in western Nova Scotia. Here, at Port Royal, France's most successful colony to date was established. The general area came to be known as Acadia. Among the lieutenants on this undertaking was a geographer named Samuel de Champlain, who promptly carried out a major exploration of the northeastern coastline of what is now the United States. Samuel Champlain, Acadia, St. Croix Island, Port Royal. Samuel Champlain left St. Croix on September 5th in a patache with 12 sailors and two Indians as guides. On the first day he covered 25 leagues and discovered many islands, reefs and rocks. To another island four or five leagues in length he gave the name of Ile des Monts Desert, which name has been preserved. On the following day, Champlain met some hunting Indians of the Etchemé tribe, proceeding from the Pentagua River to the Mount Desert Islands. Quote, I think this river, says Champlain, is that which several pilots and historians call Norembeg, and which most have described as large and extensive, with very many islands, its mouth being in latitude 43 degrees, 43 minutes, 30 seconds. It is related also that there is a large, thickly settled town of Indians who are adroit and skillful, and who have cotton yards. I am confident that most of those who mention it have not seen it, and speak of it because they have heard persons say so, who know no more about it than they themselves. But that any one has ever entered it there is no evidence, for then they would have described it in another manner, in order to relieve the minds of many of this doubt." Champlain's description is written from personal knowledge, because he had seen the Pentagua River. The country which it passes through is agreeable, but there was no town or village, and no appearance of either, with the exception of a few deserted cabins of the Suriqua or Mi'kmaq. Here Champlain met two Suriqua chiefs, Bessabe and Cabais, and succeeded in making them understand that he had been sent by de Mont to visit their country, and to assure them of the friendship of the French for the Suriqua. Champlain continued his journey southwards, and two days later he again met Cabais, of whom he asked particulars as to the course of the river Norembeg. The chief replied, quote, that they had already passed the fall, which is situated at about twenty leagues from the mouth of the river Penobscot. Here it widens into a lake, by way of which the Indians pass to the river St. Croix, by going some distance overland, and then entering the river at Chemin. Another river also enters the lake, along which they proceed for some days until they gain another lake, and pass through it. Reaching the end of it, they again make a land journey of some distance, until they reach another small river, the mouth of which is within a league of Quebec, end quote. This little river is the Chaudière, which the Indians follow to reach Quebec. On September 20th, Champlain observed the mountains of Bedabadec, and after having proceeded for ten or twelve leagues further, he decided to return to St. Croix and wait until the following year to continue his explorations. His opinion was that the region he had explored was quite as unfavorable for a settlement as St. Croix. On June 18, 1605, de Mont, at the head of an expedition consisting of Champlain, some gentlemen, twelve sailors and an Indian guide named Panonius and his wife, set out from the island of St. Croix to explore the country of the Armouchiquois and reach the Pentagua River in twelve days. On July 20th they made about twenty leagues between Bedavadec Point and the Kennebec River, at the mouth of which is an island which they named La Tortue. Continuing their journey towards the south, they observed some large mountains, the abode of an Indian chief named Aneda. Quote, I was satisfied from the name, says Champlain, that he was one of his tribe that had discovered the plant called Aneda, which Jacques Cartier said was so powerful against the malady called scurvy, which harassed his company as well as our own when they wintered in Canada. The Indians have no knowledge at all of this plant, and are not aware of its existence, although the above-mentioned Indian has the same name." This supposition was unfounded, because if this Indian had been of the same origin as the Aborigines who acquainted Jacques Cartier with the virtue of the Aneda plant in cases of scurvy, he would have understood the meaning of the word. Aneda is the Iroquois word for the spruce tree, but there is no evidence to prove that Champlain was ever aware that it was a specific. Had he known of its efficacy, he would have certainly employed it. 
At Chouacoué, de Mont and Champlain received visits from many Indians, differing entirely from either the Etchemin or the Armouchiquois. They found the soil tilled and cultivated, and the corn in the gardens was about two feet in height. Beans, pumpkins, and squash were also in flower. The place was very pleasant and agreeable at the time, but Champlain believed the weather was very severe in the winter. The party proceeded still further south, in sight of the Cap aux Îles, or Cape Porpoise, and on July 17, 1605, they came to anchor at Cape St. Louis, where an Indian chief named Honabetha paid them a visit. To a small river which they found in the vicinity, they gave the name of Gua, in honor of de Mont. The expedition passed the night of the 18th in a small bay called Cape St. Louis. On the 19th, they observed the cape of a large bay, which they distinguished by the title of Saint Suzanne du Cap Blanc, and on July 20th, they entered a spacious harbor, which proved to be very dangerous on account of shoals and banks. They therefore named it Malbar. Five weeks had now elapsed since the expedition had left Saint Croix, and no incident of importance had occurred. They had met many tribes of Indians, and on each occasion their intercourse was harmonious. It is true that they had not traversed more than three degrees of latitude, but although their progress was slow, their time was well spent. De Mont was satisfied that it would be easier to colonize Acadia than this American coast, and Champlain was still convinced that Port Royal was the most favorable spot, unless de Mont preferred Quebec. The expedition returned to St. Croix in nine days, arriving there on August 3rd. Here they found a vessel from France under the command of Captain des Antons, laden with provisions and many things suitable for winter use. There was now a chance of saving the settlers, although their position was not enviable. De Mont was determined to try the climate of Port Royal and to endeavor to establish a settlement there. Two barks were fitted out and laden with the framework of the buildings at St. Croix. Champlain and Pongravé had set out before to select a favorable site around the bay, well sheltered from the northwest wind. They chose a place opposite an island at the mouth of the river de l'Equy as being the most suitable. Everyone was soon busily engaged in clearing the ground and in erecting houses. The plan of the settlement, says Champlain, was ten fathoms long and eight fathoms wide, making the distance around thirty-six fathoms. On the eastern side was a storehouse occupying the width of it, with a very fine cellar from five to six feet deep. On the northern side were the quarters of Sieur de Mont, comfortably finished. In the back yard were the dwellings of the workmen. At the corner of the western side was a platform, upon which four cannon were placed, and at the eastern corner a palisade was constructed in the shape of a platform. There was nothing pretentious or elegant about these buildings, but they were solid and useful. The installation of the new settlement being now complete, de Mont returned to France, leaving Pont Gravé in command. During the absence of de Mont, Champlain determined to pursue his discoveries along the American coast, and in this design he was favored by de Mont, as the latter had not altogether abandoned his idea of settling in Florida. The season, however, was too far advanced, and Champlain therefore stopped at the river St. John to meet Choudon, with whom he had agreed to set out in search of the famous copper mine. They were accompanied by a miner named Jacques, and a Slavonian very skillful in discovering minerals. He found some pieces of copper in what appeared to be a mine, but it was too difficult to work. Champlain accordingly returned to Port Royal, where several of the men were suffering from scurvy. Out of forty-five, twelve died during the winter. The surgeon from Honfleur, named Deschamps, performed an autopsy on some of the bodies, and found them affected in the same manner as those who had died at St. Croix. Snow did not fall until December 20th, and the winter was not so severe as the previous one. On March 16, 1606, Champlain resumed his explorations and traveled eighteen leagues on that day. He anchored at an island to the south of Manan. During the night his bark ran ashore and sustained injuries which it required four days to repair. Champlain then proceeded to port aux coquilles seven or eight leagues distant, where he remained until the 29th. Pont Gravé, however, desired him to return to Port Royal, being anxious to obtain news of his companions whom he had left sick. Owing to indisposition, Champlain was obliged to delay his departure until April 8th. Champlain and Pont Gravé intended to return to France during the summer of 1606. Seeing that the vessels promised by de Mont had not arrived, they set out from Port Royal to Cape Breton, or Gaspé, in search of a vessel to cross the Atlantic, but when they were approaching Canso, they met Ralot, the secretary of de Mont, who informed them that a vessel had been dispatched under the command of Poutrincourt with fifty settlers for the country. They therefore returned to Port Royal, where they found Poutrincourt, who, as lieutenant general of de Mont, intended to remain at Port Royal during the year. On September 5th, Champlain left Port Royal on a voyage of discovery. Poutrincourt joined the expedition, and they took with them a physician, the carpenter Chandoré, and Robert Gravé, the son of François. This last voyage, undertaken to please de Mont, did not result in anything remarkable. 
They first paid a visit to St. Croix, where everything remained unchanged, although the gardens were flourishing. From St. Croix the expedition drifted southwards, and Champlain pointed out the same bays, harbors, capes, and mountains that he had observed before. Choudon, chief of the Etchemin, and Mesamouet, captain of the Mi'kmaq, joined the party, and proceeded with them as far as Chouacoué, where they intended to form an alliance with Olmachin and Marchim, two Indian chiefs of this country. On October 2, 1606, the expedition reached Malbar, and for a few days they anchored in a bay near Cape Paturier, which they named Port Fortuné, or Chatham. Five or six hundred Indians were found at this place. Quote, it would be an excellent place, says Champlain, to erect buildings and lay the foundation of a state, if the harbor was somewhat deeper and the entrance safer. End quote. Poutrincourt stopped here for some days, and in the meantime visited all the surrounding country, from which he returned much pleased. According to a custom peculiar to the French since the days of Jacques Cartier, de Mont had planted a large cross at the entrance of the Kennebec River, and also at Malbar. Poutrincourt did the same at Port Fortuné. The Indians seemed annoyed at this ceremony, which they evidently considered as an encroachment upon their rights as proprietors. They exhibited symptoms of discontent, and during the night they killed four Frenchmen who had imprudently stayed ashore. They were buried near the cross. This the Indians immediately threw down, but Poutrincourt ordered it to be restored to its former position. On three different occasions the party attempted to pursue their discoveries southwards, but they were prevented each time by a contrary wind. They therefore resolved to return to Port Royal, which was rendered imperative both by the approach of winter and the scarcity of provisions. The result of the voyage was not altogether satisfactory. Champlain had perhaps held a degree further south than on the former occasion, but he had not discovered anything of importance. On their return to Port Royal, the voyagers were received with great ceremony. Lescarbot, a Parisian lawyer who had arrived some time before, and some other Frenchmen, went to meet them and conducted them to the fort, which had been decorated with evergreens and inscriptions. On the principal door they had placed the arms of France, surrounded with laurel crowns and the king's motto, Duo Protegit Unus. Beneath the arms of de Mont was placed this inscription, Dabit Deus his quoque finem. The arms of Poutrincourt were wreathed with crowns of leaves with his motto, in via virtuti nulla est via. L'Escarbot had composed a short drama for the occasion entitled Le Théâtre de Neptune. The winter of 1606-07 was not very severe. The settlers lived happily in spite of the scurvy, from which some of them died. Hunting afforded them the means of providing a great variety of dishes, such as geese, ducks, bears, beavers, partridges, reindeer, bustards, etc. They also organized a society devoted to good cheer called Ordre du Bon Temps, the bylaws of which were definite and were fixed by Champlain himself. The Indians of the vicinity, who were friendly towards the French colony, were in need of food, so that each day loaves of bread were distributed amongst them. Their sagamo, named Member Two, was admitted as a guest to the table of Poutrincourt. This famous Souriquois, who was very old at that time, probably a hundred years, though he had not a single white hair, pretended to have known Jacques Cartier at the time of his first voyage, and claimed that in 1534 he was married and the father of a young family. L'Escarbot, who was an able man and a good historian, records the particulars above related, besides many other interesting facts concerning Port Royal, which appear to have escaped Champlain's observation. L'Escarbot was an active spirit in the life of the first French colony in Acadia. He encouraged his companions to cultivate their land, and he worked himself in the gardens, sowing wheat, oats, beans, peas, and herbs, which he tended with care. He was also liked by the Indians, and he would have rejoiced to see them converted to Christianity. L'Escarbot was a poet and a preacher, and had also a good knowledge of the arts and of medicine. Charlevoix says, quote, He daily invented something new for the public good, and there was never a stronger proof of what a new settlement might derive from a mind cultivated by study and induced by patriotism to use its knowledge and reflections. We are indebted to this advocate for the best memoirs of what passed before his eyes and for a history of French Florida. We then behold an exact and judicious writer, a man with views of his own, and who would have been as capable of founding a colony as of writing its history." End quote. With the departure of Lescarbot and Champlain, the best page of the history of Port Royal is closed. The two men left on September 2, 1607, on board the Jonas, commanded by Nicolas Martin. They stopped at Roscoff in Basse-Bretagne, and the vessel arrived at Havre de Grasse in the early days of October. Poutrincourt, his son Biencourt, and Lescarbot made a pilgrimage to Mont-Saint-Michel, and Champlain went to Brouage, his native country, having sojourned in America for three years and five months. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>